He said, on your wedding day, on your wedding day, if Jesus says, I'm coming, I'll say, Jesus, wait, oh, wait. <laughs> Christians, I heard the person say it live. Say, if on your wedding day, Jesus says, I'm about to come, what will you do? Christians were saying, we will tell him to wait. You know why? They want to have sex. Now me and I don't go marry. Go. <laughs> so tell, tell Jesus. Jesus to wait. Not because you want to win a solo. You need to marry urgently. I cannot have been a virgin for 35 years and Jesus is coming. What I, so I suffered for nothing. <laughs> no. Woe unto thee if thou marriest not. <laughs> no. Say they will tell Jesus to wait. Because they don't know that here we do not have a continuing city. So we have not begun to seek the city that is to come. You know what is coming? Eternal life. A body that will not die. Do you know what is coming? The Bible says there are no tears there. No sorrow. That's what's coming. You know what's coming? We are going to be like the angels. <laughs> we are going to enjoy God. All this pressure that exists in this realm is not there that's what some of us used to encourage ourselves. We will not trade our rewards that are waiting on the other side, the crown of life. We will not trade those rewards for temporal pleasures. May none in our company, whether Arusian on site, Arusian worry online, none in our company may none be like Esau. Esau. The Bible called him an immoral and carnal man. Why? He could not see beyond today. He could not see beyond this moment. It's because people don't live in it with eternity in view that, that sexual immorality looks attractive. You, you, you sacrifice the city that is to come for three minutes, four minutes, ten minutes of sexual pleasure. It's because you do not know that here yeah, we do not have a continuing city. When you understand the suffering with Christ, go back to verse 12. Go back to verse 12. Suffering with Christ. The Bible says, so that he might sanctify the people with his own blood. He was looking at what was ahead. The reason Jesus was willing to die was because the people needed to be sanctified with his blood. Man needed to be redeemed. Jesus was looking beyond here and now. He was seeing the plan of God. And he said this plan is what going to the cross for. He said he suffered outside the gate. You too, brother, you will suffer outside the gate. You too will suffer outside the camp. And you will not count it anything like I was telling us on Sunday, last Sunday. You will count it all joy. Suffering with Jesus. Like Peter was trying to explain that when we suffer, we should suffer because we are Christians. Not suffer because we are a murderer. Suffer because we are a thief. That's not the kind of suffering. If you steal something and they put you in prison, it's good suffering. You are, you are bearing the consequence of your breaking civil laws or criminal laws or whatever. Right? But when you suffer as a Christian, that's the kind of suffering that you should count as joy. Why? Because we look for the city that is not here. So once you understand this, you begin to put systems in place to guarantee that you are not vulnerable. These three points are the foundations upon which your personal city 
the walls of your personal city must be built. Your love for God, your commitment to hear sound doctrine, and number three, your willingness to live with eternity in view. The consciousness that I'm not just a creature of time. The end of my pilgrimage is a dwelling in that city. The Bible says that we are going to judge nations with Christ. We will join him. So that means there's a seat of, for, for a judge with your name on it. A seat for a judge with your name on it. To so him that puts his hand on the plow and begins to look back is not fit for the kingdom. He's not one that God can entrust with serious kingdom matters. The reason you will begin to look back when you put your hand on the plow is that you feel what is ahead is not valuable enough. So you take it for granted. You play games with your spiritual life. Are you ready for us to go further now? Hallelujah. Are you getting blessed? Don't worry, there's going to be Q&A today. Once I finish teaching, we pray. Then we take a stretch break, five minutes. You stretch your leg, stretch your back. Then we'll do Q&A. If you have questions from the teaching, questions on doctrinal matters that are troubling you, on-site, online, we'll try to answer as many as possible. So part of the questions that you must now begin to ask is, like Pastor Oji was trying to enter into, but he didn't enter fully, is why will God, why will God allow his precious city to be broken into? That the walls will be broken, the gates will be burnt, and the city will be left in ruins. Why will God allow such a thing? Because builders will not be necessary if they are not, there's no destruction. God will not now have to raise functionaries, train people how to build, have to go and look for a Zerubbabel, who was the one that was responsible for the building of the temple, have to go and raise a Nehemiah, the one that was responsible for the building of the walls. Why will God go through all that trouble? Why allow cities, Jerusalem, to be broken into in the first place. Why? Jesus had, I mean, God had promised them that he was going to keep them in their city forever. None will be able to come against them. But somehow, we are reading now that the walls were broken down, the gates were burned, and the temple destroyed. The city was left to lie in waste. And in, as we saw in Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 17 yesterday, that they became a reproach. You remember I told you what a reproach is? A reproach goes one step beyond shame. In a reproach, people are looking at you with contempt. That is, they consider you worthless. Consider the individual worthless. That's the place of reproach. Why will God allow his people become a reproach? Why? Why bring them to such shame, such disgrace, such position of, 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 of pain? Have you read, I think it's Psalm 137, or is it 132? Let me see. 137. Give me verse 1. Psalm 137, verse 1. By the rivers of Babylon, now they, they, they've carried them from Jerusalem. Burnt the, the, the city down. Reduce it to rubbles. And they got to Babylon. You know, the soldiers with the slaves, the slaves are sitting by the rivers of Babylon. They said, there we sat down. Yea, we wept. When we what? Remember Zion. There's a song like this. Uh-huh. There we sat down, and there we were, when we remembered that. Carried us 
us away captivity, demoyal from us a song. Can we sing the Lord's song in a strain? Have you ever tried to ask what this song means? It's a sweet song, oh. If we press the keyboard now, we go, Palo Ve Suva. What do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean? Why were they weeping? They wept when they remembered what? Zion. I like this kind of scriptures because here they are not thinking about cucumber and garlic. <laughs> they remembered Zion. You know, I, I was there when it happened. And they told you the story. It's not the same. Can you imagine being dragged across the streets of Jerusalem and you are seeing the temple being burnt down? Can you imagine being... They are marching them from... You know, they, they didn't put them inside Bosso. It's not coaster. They marched them out of the city the armies of Babylon, of Nebuchadnezzar. Come on, move! Imagine that you woke up that morning thinking that you were going to cook pancakes. And then Babylon invaded. And they were marched. As they were going, they saw the gate of Jerusalem being burnt. The walls in rubbles. So they sat down by the rivers. And they wept. Now, to rub insult into injury. Verse 2. Verse 2. We hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it. Now, they are speaking about Zion. When they used to go, you know, the, the Bible has what they call songs of ascension. You know, they used to sing. They used to praise God. They used to celebrate worship, enjoy their God. Verse 3. For there, those who carried us away captive asked of us a song. And those who plundered us requested mirth, saying, Sing us what? One of the songs of Zion. What are they trying to say to them? They knew that if Israel were to sing their songs unto God, in their songs to God, they will describe their relationship with God. And in their songs to God, they will describe the power of God. Are you here? So, they wanted them to sit as captives and sing, our God is able to save. Then they will say, not be you, it is. Are you getting it? Because in their songs, they will reveal God's character, reveal his faithfulness. So they say, sing us one of Zion's songs. So that they could mock them and prove to them that these, the wordings of their songs were a, an opposite of their current reality. So this is why they said in the next verse, how shall we sing the Lord's song? Where? In a foreign land. This is the kind of pain that they were going through. Their hearts were bleeding. Their reality was negative. Sons were going to be slaves in Babylon. It's from this siege that men like Daniel, Mishael, Ananiah, and Azariah were chosen. Free men in Zion. But they were to become slaves in Babylon. And because of the context in which Daniel is written, we are able to at least conclude that they must have been castrated and made eunuchs. Because the one whom they were committed to, to watch over their daily rations and to prepare them for the meeting with the king, he was described as the chief of eunuchs. You will not commit normal men to a eunuch to supervise, except the idea is to make them one of that company. Castrated. Men that were born free. This was the pain of Israel. Why will God 
allow such kind of pain come to his people. Why? And you see, by the time you study Jeremiah's prophecy carefully, you will find out that the matter with Israel was the matter of sin and idolatry. 